Okay, hello again. So um, uh, this talk is going to be divided in two parts. So I'm going to start talking about, um, you know, the first chapter of the book, which is about the 60s and 70s. And then I will come to the last chapter of the book, which is uh, the present. So um, we're going to, to do like that. So uh, I'm going to read and, and, um, and then we can talk. So part one, right? I'm going to start now. Uh, Brazil had and still has a unique position in the global scene with regard to the prominence of women visual artists. They had long been accepted and even lauded as key figures in a vibrant and progressive culture, enjoying more recognition in the country's cultural sphere than their North American and European counterparts. Since the 1920s, they had been praised for creating a visual identity for Brazilian art. Their works were included in prestigious international private and museum collections. And moreover, some had even commanded higher prices in the art market than their male peers. There was no Brazilian equivalent to Linda Nochlin's 1971 essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? Because there was no need for it. The assumption was that female artists already had a place at the table. While Brazilian women artists enjoyed a unique position in terms of visibility and prominence, that does not mean that they didn't face adversity and constraints because of their gender. Although they may have been part of the local art scene in ways their peers elsewhere were not, they still faced challenges and pressures. So I'm just showing um, a, a picture of uh, Tarsila do Amaral, which really um, is someone who is credited to giving like the visual, um, you know, the visuality for what is called modern art in Brazil. In Brazil, the 60s and 70s were a period of intense political turmoil. The country was ruled by a brutal military regime between 1964 and 1985. During that time, political and civil rights were suspended and torture was sanctioned as a means of intimidating political opponents. The military regime enjoyed considerable support among conservative sectors of society, such as wealthy landowners and industrialists who sought security and feared the spread of communism, social reforms, and popular movements. Concerned about the influence from Cuba and the Soviet Union, the United States embraced a strong anti-communist agenda in its Latin American foreign policy. Following the Brazilian coup, the United States lended support to the military regime, giving it a veneer of legitimacy in the international arena. With resistance to authoritarian rule being the dominant concern, many women artists shun the mantle of feminism as limiting or worse, divisive and counterproductive. For many women artists living in Brazil in the late 60s and 70s, the fight against the dictatorship trumped the battle for individual freedom. This gender-related discussions took a back seat to more pressing matters. Political resistance to the dictatorship was the order of the day, and any other issue was considered a distraction. Nothing could or should divide one's attention. While many Brazilian female artists refused the term feminism, they still employed feminist strategies without naming it as such or finding a better term to define their specific practices. This dismissal was influenced by a complexity of issues, the country's authoritarian and patriarchal structures, the macho attitudes of cultural agents, the similar prominence place female artists enjoyed in the artistic community, the view of the dictatorship as a unifying enemy and the disdain of both the sectarian left and the right for women's personal experiences. Moreover, the feminist movement was considered one more enterprise orchestrated by the United States. Thus, ironically, the choice of these artists not to claim it became part of an anti-imperialist gesture. Even if these female artists didn't want to be identified as women artists, they were expected to operate within certain parameters. 
since women artists did not wish to lose the support of their allies, among them powerful male critics, discussions of the country's visual arts never centered on the battle of the, sex the sexes. The common assumption was that good artists were good artists regardless of gender. It's not surprising then that in this environment, artworks with female-centered topics and perspectives were dismissed as simplistic, demagogic, and reductive. Maria Martins, for instance, returned to Brazil in 1949 after living for many years abroad. In 1957, the influential Brazilian art critic Mario Pedrosa, one of the most progressive critics of the time, condemned Martins' work for being too subjective and lacking formal qualities. Pedroza wrote, quote, Maria's pieces never detached themselves from herself, unquote. Very few artists from this period challenged the assumption that artworks deemed personal were simplistic, demagogic, and reductive. Ana Maria Maiolino went against the tide when she depicted herself in the familiar role. Her intimate family portrait in this photograph courageously speaks to her inseparable duties as a professional daughter and mother, attention that although all too common was kept out of the public view at the time. Here the artist is shown sitting between her mother and her teenage daughter, a piece of thread leading from mouse to mouse to mouse, creating a sense of continuity and connection as if they all shared a common umbilical cord through this matriarchal lineage. During the dictatorship, patriarchal relations became intertwined with the repressive character of the military regime and its ideas of order and progress. In a culture famed for its sensuality, surprisingly, artworks that violated a sense of decorum about sexuality and eroticism raised alarm. It is curious that in Brazil, where women's sensuality is a matter of national pride, as seen in tropes of carnival, tropicality, and Carmen Miranda, no relevant work in the visual arts from the 60s and 70s fully exposed the naked female body in public. Conservative patriarchal views of women's issues were adopted by most prominent segments of society, including the right, the left, and the church. The right was represented by the military regime. The church embraced all doctrines concerning family, maternity, and sexuality. Issues really related to reprodu reproductive rights were seen as an insult to the moral values of the Christian family. The opinion of liberal professionals was also decisive to the negative reception of, women's, of the women's movement in Brazilian visual arts. Independent of any party or organization, the so-called intelligentsia cast the movement as a distasteful light by calling feminism anti-feminine. Furthermore, the privileged domestic situation of many women artists in Brazil made addressing gender issues uncomfortable. Back in the 60s and 70s, there were fewer opportunities for social mobility and the art scene was restricted to members of the white, upper and middle classes who had economic and cultural capital to navigate an elitist art world. Brazilian art historian Aracy Amaral gave a compelling explanation for the lack of interest in disturbing the status quo, quote, the presence even today of one or more domestic helpers in the household providing services for the middle and upper classes always gave Brazilian women the opportunity to dedicate themselves to the arts, a condition that their North American counterparts could not afford. This raises a crucial point. The interest of white middle-class women in Brazil, including the majority of prominent female visual artists, were radically different from those of dark-skinned working-class women who often served as caretakers, nannies, cooks, or cleaning ladies. In reality, affluent women had little interest in ending their reliance on working-class women's labor, since it released them from the confinement and obligations of the household sphere. Thus, the socioeconomic discrepancy among different social classes helped whisk away any discussion of gender inequality. 
Despite taking advantage from their status quo in society, white middle-class Latin American women also had their own set of constraints. In the series of 12 black and white photographs titled Teen America, Regina Vater plays with the stereotypes associated with her own social background. Vater called attention to what she considered to be the self-objectification performed by Latin American women. Posing in close-ups, she created a series of characters, teacher, social activist, socialite, reputable woman, by donning different hairdos, accessories, and clothes. Such transformations were part of an effort by women to fit roles deemed acceptable during the 60s and 70s, when a proper young lady was not supposed to leave her parents' home before getting married, and the ultimate goal was to find an eligible bachelor. Given the powerful weight of social norms and the limited avenues for women's independence, those who followed the Catholic morality and accepted the contract of marriage increased their potential to be accepted and to advance in society. The various characters in Teen American are stylized and projected to seduce yet imitate the image of wannabe bride. Fittingly, Vater first exhibited this photographic sequence on the pages of a wedding album. The refusal to be object objectified as a suitable woman also was central to Ana Maria Maiolino's five black and white photographs. Maiolino's face has been gift wrapped as an attractive object ready to be purchased or offered. In this series, Maiolino confronts the pressure to meet conventional standards and demands for female beauty. It is an ironic comment on women's objectification and the quest for beautification for male consumption. In the video preparation, Leticia Parente stands before a bathroom mirror, brushing her hair and readying herself for the day. Instead of applying makeup, she places tape over her mouth and then aligns the shape of her lips with lipstick. Then she puts tape over her eyes and draws the eyes with eyelashes. Finally, she checks her appearance and exits the bathroom. Sight and speech occluded, Parente he attests to the impossibility of bearing witness under the authoritarian regime. The video is also critical of the conventions of beauty promoted by the media and advertising, targeting women forces that dictated life standards and behaviors to make them desirable, young, beautiful, healthy, and modern. Like Regina Vater, Letizia Parente, and Ana Maria Maiolino discuss here, many female artists from the period also address the coercion of women's body, the mechanisms of social discipline imposed on them, the conduct and behavior expected of women and the transgressive and irreverent ways in which they use their bodies to define German, uh, gender norms and transcend social codes and taboos. For them, a woman's body was not just a place of oppression, but the locus of resistance to the patriarchal order. In their artistic productions, it is possible to identify attitudes and themes clearly connected with feminist agendas of the time. Even if they were skeptical of the term feminism, they did not refrain from engaging in it as a strategy. So moving now to part two, which is moving forward in time. Back in the 60s and 70s, there were fewer opportunities for social mobility and the art scene was restricted to members of the upper and middle classes who had the economic and cultural capital to navigate an elitist art world. At the dawn of the 21st century, a new generation of visual artists entered the scene. Those artists no longer came exclusively from the upper sectors of society, but from diverse backgrounds. Through them, discussions of gender inequality and debates on race and class discrimination low overdue in Brazilian society came to the forefront, marking major changes and ruptures with past generations. This young, artists overtly embraced feminism, questioned compulsory motherhood while fighting for women's reproductive rights and access to abortion. This new generation no longer only came from Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, the main cultural centers of Brazil, but also from various regions of the country outside major urban centers. 
through the more inclusive digital and social media networks and the system of racial quotas that was instituted at public universities in Brazil in 2012, this new generation was able to ascend into the artistic scene. Liz Paraíso grew up in a working class community in Campo Grande in the West Zone of Rio de Janeiro, outside the city's economic power and artistic scene. Self-identifying as a non-binary and queer, Paraíso expanded and challenged the essentialist ontolog ontological category of women to include bodies like her. In Brazil, a country with one of the highest death rates for LGBTQI plus community, it is dangerous for people who are assigned male at birth to cross dress, wear makeup, or have polished nails exposed in public. For Paraíso, polished pink nails is a powerful statement of defiance. Quote, I live with my nails polished from a marginal community in Campo Grande, and I have to travel hours by bus to get to school or to work. I won't be afraid of anything or anybody, unquote. Paraíso also addresses the politics or the poetics of nonconformist bodies in her exquisite series of warfare jewelry. These sculptures jewelry are double-edged objects stored like relics in specially crafted boxes. Paraíso's artifacts are elegant pieces that can be worn to defend and caress. Yet, they are also claw-like, razor-sharp, and scary, and can be used to harm and injure. They are simultaneously delicate and threatening. They are seductive, yet violent. They are made for bodies like hers that must be prepared to attack in order to be protected. In 2018, Paraíso started her series of illuminant sculptures called Bichinhas, or maybe Little Queers in English, in which she pays homage to the artist Ligia Clark's iconic hinged bichos sculptures from the 60s. The Portuguese word bichos, like uh, in Ligia Clark, spelled with the CH, means animals or critters, but when it's spelled with an X, like in Paraíso, it means queers or maybe faggots. While Paraíso's constructions clearly nod to Ligia Clark's bichos, their edges resemble blades and suggest weapons like razor blades, which travestis, loosely translated as transvestites in English, often carry to defend themselves in the streets, thus adding an aggressive layer to these iconic sculptures. With the mixture of tribute and transgression to the historical artist Ligia Clark, Paraíso suggests the possibility of incorporating dissident subjectivities into the celebrated Brazilian neoconcrete movement, thus expanding the country's artistic canon. Renata Felindo's practice also addresses perverse mechanism of discrimination. In her dark humorous performances, Felindo focuses on the notion of branquitude, which is white supremacy or white privilege. In White Face and Blonde Hair from 2012, Felinto dresses as a white executive and wears a long blonde wig with straight hair, sunglasses, white shirt, black skirt, high heels, handbag, and pearl necklace. She walks through Sao Paulo's upscale Jardins neighborhood, browsing at the high-end boutiques and sipping coffee at fancy cafes. A white blonde socialite would pass a notice in this situation, but what is a black woman with white makeup on her face doing in these spaces of privilege? As Felinto applies her white makeup, she scorns the racist theatrical form of black face. In her satire of white women, Felinto inverts the offense, making fun of those who usually are the ones who stigmatize the other. Felinto's palpable presence is the reverse of the invisibility of white women in spaces of privilege. Her works highlight spaces of white entitlement that are seen as neutral by society. As the psychologist Edith Pisa noted, having a, having a white identity is the same of having no identity. It is to be perceived as natural. To be white is to give identity to others. It is the other they are seen, evaluated, named, classified, forgotten. 
Felintus caricature of women from the middle and upper classes put a magnifying glass on white supremacy and its exclusionary system of power in Brazilian society. Like Renata Filinto in Lis Paraíso, Salissa Rosa also performs the discrimination experienced by groups that fall outside dominant modes of existence in Brazil. In Salissa Rosa case, her attention is focused on her Amerindian roots. Misconceptions about indigenous communities often misrepresented as uncivilized are still common in Brazil, just as their survival remains precarious. There are still approximately 250 distinct ethnic groups that speak more than 150 languages and dialects in Brazil. Yet they are lumped under a homogeneous, generic and unifying umbrella, depriving them of their own singular identities. Born in the city of Goiana in the north of Brazil, Salissa Rosa has never lived in an indigenous village despite her ancestry. She entered the art scene in the first decades of the 21st century at a moment when indigenous artists began demanding their legitimacy and to be acknowledged. Salisa Rosa said, quote, the tribes today have internet technology. There is no purity. I'm tired of being invited to art openings where people expect me to arrive in the feather headdress with a painted body and to make small colored signals while performing native chants. It is annoying, unquote. Tired of such expectations, Salisa Rosa developed the ironic and humorous series called Identity is Fiction, which plays with exotic cliches of Amerindians. In digital self-portraits, she exaggerates folkloric indigenous stereotypes to the point of the ridiculous, showing how particular forms of existence are devaluated or turned into exotic objects. In one of the selfies taken in the children's background, Salisa Rosa places her head inside a dinosaur, a dinosaur mouse, mocking the misconception that native people are somehow creatures from the prehistoric era. The last artist I'll discuss tonight, Alita, Alita Valente, addresses female sexual liberation and reproductive rights. Valente grew up on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro in Bangu, famous for being the hottest place in the state and home of maximum security prison. Like most of the West Zone of Rio de Janeiro, Bangu is featured on no tourist postcards of the city. It was once a working class neighborhood and a commuter town, but over the years it became a rundown area surrounded by favelas where crime and drug trafficking are rampant. Valentes uses the unappealing social landscape of Bangu as the site of her photos that she takes with her cell phone and then posts on social media. In one of the selfies, she crouches over piles of chip construction materials in front of an unfinished cinder block wall, striking a provocative pose and staring at the viewer. The image is part of a series of selfies titled Material Girl, in which the artist turns herself into a, a tropical, impoverished version of the pop star Madonna. Instead of Madonna's affluent, glamorous material world, the setting for this image is the rubbles and bricks used to erect homes in lower income communities. Valente exaggerates what is expected to women like her. Coming from the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro, she's conscious of the ways in which she can be pigeonholed as a victim of social immobility in a system based of privilege. She refuses to let this construction of her as an oppressed subject stand unchallenged and decided to create a proactive narrative of herself through images, photographs, and selfies posted on Instagram, thus launching her career in the visual arts. Valente, in this photograph, Social Ascent, Valente addresses social immobility. She displays the full power of her seductiveness, accentuating her buttocks in a tiny thong bikini while stepping up on a steady ladder that ultimately leads nowhere. In this modern critique, Brazilian sensuality and attractiveness are seen as the few possible attributes in the ascent to cultural, academic, or professional success for those with no access to the system of privilege based on wealth, pedigree, or education. 
in the series Not Pregnant from 2015, Valente posted images of her monthly birth control chart. The most controversial piece in her photo was with long, the most controversial piece is this photo with long braids falling over her body in an awkward contorted yogi-like pose that reveals a red bloody stain at her crotch. Valencia originally intended to share this selfie only with friends and followers, but in the digital era, such images escape one's control. Valencia image soon circulated widely on the internet. Having disrupted codes of decorum and femininity, public humiliation followed. Soon after Valente posted the image, it was appropriated by an anti-feminist Facebook group. Hateful and misogynist insults soon followed, and Valente became the target of cyberbullying. Valente incorporated the misogynistic messages from her det detractors into her work, displaying them next to the selfie. If Valente's attacker saw menstruation as degrading and offensive, she understood it as a sign of freedom. She had become pregnant at the age of 17. Like many young women with few resources, abortion is not an option since it is officially prohibited in Brazil. In one of her most polemical self-constructed images titled Homeless of, or Hipsters from 2016, Valente is shown with short platinum hair, a black bathing suit, a fake mustache and a long beard. The artific artificiality of the image is highlighted, leaving no doubt that this is a woman posing as a non-binary person. She leans over a large plastic bag filled with aluminum cans like those carried by homeless people who earn money by recycling trash. The most disturbing aspect of this image is not Valente's port portrayal of a homeless person, but her transmutation through the artifice of a false mustache and a beard into a gender fluid person, a figure that she criticized as the new hipster of society. Valente shares the perspective of some red femmes who believe that anyone born like a cis man retains male privilege in society, even if they choose to live as a woman. Valente's view of transgender women has alienated her from her peers and produce a accusation of transphobia. It was as if early assaults launched upon her via social media had left the virtual tribunal to become a reality. This time, anti-feminists could not be blamed since the attack was carried out by trans artists and activists. So to conclude, why did they choose to choose these artists here tonight? Because their voices comprise a myriad of conflicting and competing views, making, I think, the discussion stimulating. Each one of them presents a singular universe, and they invite us to ponder a multiplicity of issues posed by their works. These artists, in their own way, question invisible systems of power and privilege by inviting viewers to reassess established ideas of self-representation taboos and public norms of behaviors, they provoke polemics and controversy, attracting criticism and hostility. Through their bold practices and the center narratives, they reveal territories that have been so far invisible, creating anti-postcards of a country in which poverty is part of a daily reality. Their work is a testimony to their time as they strategically employ their pussy ass and tits as potent weapons to promote multiple agendas, they become the new face of Brazilian feminism and the innovative agents of social change. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Is the mic working? Um, my name is Lydia Hernandez. I'm a PhD candidate at the Latin American, Iberian and Latino Cultures Department here at the Graduate Center. And um, I'm totally honored to be to have the privilege to ask you a few questions before we actually open the debate to the audience. And um, Professor, 
I'm working on a topic. I mean, my dissertation topic has to do with Cuban modern art. So your book was really inspiring um, from a methodological perspective. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you has, has to do with uh, one of the main themes in the book, which is how uh, within Brazil, you know, there was a lack of debate about identity politics, but then in contrast, they were like very worried about how the, the category of Latin American art was constructed outside um, Brazil by elite institutions. And um, my first question would be like how the way that Brazilian art or the idea of Brazilian art was, was constructed outside the country affected the way that artists produce their work. Is that uh, thank you, thanks, Lydia, for for uh, your question. Uh, I think I think Brazilian artists are very pissed to be called Latin American, really, because uh, you know Brazil speaks Portuguese, doesn't speak Spanish. Uh, you know those artists they're closer to Paris than really to the rest of Latin America. Uh, most of them didn't know Latin America, didn't travel through Latin America. So the fact that, uh, you know, they are seen as Latin American artists was a, another way for them to be pigeonholed into some kind of label that they didn't think they belonged. So uh, all of this uh, for them, I think, uh, that's my my view, is a construct. It's like an, a, a North American construct, like the idea of Latin American artists or women artists or all this idea of identity politics is something that has been very much rejected over the many decades in Brazil. And as I explained today, uh, it was really only in after the 2013, I think that's kind of the, the time, the moment that this kind of change with this new ge generation that is, um, you know, that assumes that, 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 that is kind of identifying themselves as Amerigians, as uh, black artists, or, and want to talk about these issues, but uh, it took many years for this to happen. And, uh, and you know, it's like, I think, uh, you know, when artists are, uh, what they make it here, then they make it there. And I think that's very much all over Latin America for all the countries. I don't think it's only something about uh, Brazil. Thank you. But I think they're shocked to come here and feel like they're Latin Americans. I don't think they think that that's a good way to to define because um, that distance really to the rest of South America. Right. And um, I also love how your book, how you present all this context that we could see or we could read as a cultural history of, you know, um, the production of femininity or, or the construction of femininity in Brazil through visual art. And um, one of the tensions that I found interesting was how you talk about the work that these uh, female artists were producing being perceived as, you know, them trying to um, move their career, their individual careers forward versus the collective project of Brazilian art. So can you talk about that tension and how female artists created alliances between themselves to um, push the idea of Brazilian art forward, the project of Brazilian art? I, I, I don't see that really. I, you know, I think it's a, you know, it's a very valid question, but I don't see it that way. I think it's very much uh, individualized. I don't think there was like a movement that they belonged, that they were together working. Uh, as a group of women to, to, to advance, not in the visual arts, maybe in uh, in the social sphere, I'm sure that happened. Uh, you know, there's a lot of advancements, uh, you know, about uh, uh, care for, for uh, children and, uh, you know, like social rights, like equality of salary. So in, in the social realm, uh, in the social front, there was a lot of uh, groups of women working together. But in the, in, the, in, the, in the visual arts, I think it was a very kind of individual project. And uh, the only common enemy uh, was the dictatorship. So this was, I mean, I think you, if you talk to any artist from the 60s and 70s, they, they are going to say, uh, this was our priority. We were not interested in talking about abortion or reproductive rights because there was no space for that. It was Everybody was looking at the dictatorship, the military, regime and we were against that and everything that was not that was decisive so so in that way there was a common enemy but i don't think that 
it was a collective effort to, uh, you know, to, to, to fight against it, individual arts. And do you think that was because of class differences, because of race differences? Like, what think, got in the way? I think because artists are very individualist. <laughs> That's what I think. I mean, right? <laughs> Anybody who deals with artists kind of know that. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, I think it's interesting, like, they were, for instance, Lija Papi, an, uh, Annabella Geiger, uh, they were, uh, they have a lot of works, they are about indigenous people, and they were really talking, uh, you know, on the name of indigenous people, but today they're criticized for doing that. I, I don't agree with that. I think they were, they were sincerely doing that because indigenous artists didn't have a voice then. So, you know, these artists from the 60s and 70s took their place of privilege to talk about indigenous people more than uh, African-American artists, I would say. But, you know, but today there's a lot of revisionism and they are being criticized for talking for the other. Uh, again, um, you know, it's a different moment in time. It's just an interesting context, uh, contrast when you think about visual art and music, for example, mm -hmm. musical movements within Brazil and how yeah. um, artists, musicians were able to come together and create these movements. Absolutely, right? yeah. yeah, very much, yeah, very much so. I think, you know, music is much less elitist than the visual arts, right? Yeah. Much more visible. The, the, the visual arts like such a small like little uh, bundle of people it, and it was more and more in the 70s and 60s today it's much more there more much many more people participating but in the 60s or 70s there were no galleries there was no system uh you know like uh institutional system like working so you know you didn't have those things in place like you have today to to really connect people you had the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro. That was a place where artists would hang out, would, uh, you know, but I don't think they were working collectively, as you asked. Right. And um, so another aspect that I found really interesting um, in the book is when you talk about the the role that social media has played, right, in um making the 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 work produced by the artist artivist um, mm -hmm. generation more mm -hmm. visible right so how can you talk about that the role of um social media but also technology more broadly hand in hand with how these artists yeah. embrace feminism I, th I think today you don't need galleries you don't need this uh whole system the whole institutional system to be an artist you can be an artist on instagram you can have i don't know thousands of followers right in social media and uh like i show alita valeta valente she really became an artist um on social media on facebook on instagram so uh it's a very different moment now where you can launch your career without having to have a representation uh without having to be in the museum, you know, there is this whole virtual world that um, exists today. Uh, and this new generation, you know, from the years 2000, they all come from, from that, that place. So, uh, so, so they really don't need the mediation of a dealer. You know, they can sell their works through the internet. So, so in a way, it's a much more open kind of system than I think um, we had before. So it's kind of exploded the boundaries of being an artist. I mean, you have much more visibility than you had before, right? Yeah. And I think that um, creates di different kinds of productions. I mean, a lot of the artists I show, they, they started really as artists producing for the internet. And they as they become more visible, more, you know, they, they are taken by galleries and they start being part of the system, but they don't start as part of the system. Right. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to think about this social media phenomenon in relation to the market, right? Like how the artists are not only like producing their art, but also like in charge of Sa sales. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think that's a, a, a big thing. You have a whole, you know, they, they're creating their own world, their own connections. But the problem is that they also cancel. 
right. they always be, you know, a lot of them are being canceled. Uh, and a lot of them put things on Instagram and Instagram take down their pages. I mean, there's a lot of issues also with social media. I mean, you know, cyberbullying. I mean, I'm scared. I don't know if you guys are. But, you know, have to be very careful, right, how to navigate. Uh, and these artists, you saw, they're very bold. So it's not that they are, you know, kind of uh, protecting themselves. So like Aleta was really canceled, like, like brutally canceled by uh, other artists because her position of this idea that she thinks that woman is a woman and man is a man, which is a very conservative in, in some ways, but, you know, she was totally canceled and had, she, she, last week she performed the death of Aleta Valente as an artist. So, you know, she's doing like a rebirth, I guess, but brutal. Well, that's it for me. Um, if you guys have questions. Anybody has any comments? Thank so much questions? for your presentation. It was very Thank interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, of course. Um, so that I think is the most fascinating thing about the book um, is the, the way that um, female artists are thinking about military dictatorship as somehow separate from the military. Right. And I think there's a balance when we talk about it as well. Um, that the political economy and military dictatorship, whether it's the Ellsworth world or even sort of classical fashion examples in Europe, um, always rely on, on limiting the social role of women. Um, and it's pretty foundational, I think, at least to the political economy and dictatorship. So it's very surprising to me, at least, that um, artists who are launching a campaign against the military dictatorship would see reproductive freedom and abortion as separate issues from um, sort of the way the gender nature of the, of the dictatorship in general. And, and from what I know of the um, specificities of the history of Brazil, um, you know, in that case as well, you, like there's it's used that the social role of women is a big problem. So, do you have any insights into why the things that disconnect? Is it has done any have something to do with sort of like internalized uh, norms? Or, I mean, how do we explain this disconnect? Yeah. No. No. no, again, in the social realm, there was a lot of uh activism feminist activism like you know happening and going on so it's it's i think that's something specific of the visual arts uh because women were recognized as artists as good artists which didn't happen here for instance right women was were relegated to a second pl plant right it was a second uh secondary role because they were uh recognized as equals of her male peers, I think they also adopted the same kind of discourse. So for, for these uh, male critics, these issues are like nothing that you should put in your art. Art should be about art and not about feminine issues. If you did that, you would be like, weak as a weak artist because this is not a topic for your art this, today is a topic for the art but at the point that point this was not a topic that you could explore if you did this you're going to be looked down by the powers uh in place which of course are the male critics right you have the whole idea of cultural productors saying feminist is anti-feminine Right uh, when Betty Freedom came to 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 Brazil, she was right called ugly and uh, you know anti-feminine and all these kinds of things that they really put together. So I think women didn't want to be part of the way feminism, uh, the label, was being perceived. And if they brought those kinds of issues into their art, they would have been seen as using like a crutch because art you know Brazil is known for geometric abstraction right at that moment so this was not these were not well looked topics to be discussed in the visual arts um and I think you would be punished if you did it like you would be relegated to um, a second role does it make sense but I mean, it's very complex. I think it's fascinating. It is fascinating. 
but it is very complex. It took me a long time to understand. Because you see Leticia Parent, I want to show you with the tape in her face. The it's always only interpreted as a work against the dictatorship, never as a work against social norms of beauty. But you can see that, right? But you know, that reading is much more recent than at the time. So so the way to look at that, it is through this kind of, you know this idea of going against the, the dictatorship. And I show you a few works that women were dealing with women issues, but it's not like the majority of works were about that, not at all. Yeah. No, there's no. Um, you know, it seems that that is also acceptable from the body and part of the, the problem. Uh, does that come up? No, it does. Yeah. It, it does. But it, it, of course, the body is the first one to be attacked, right? In, in the torture or in the dictatorship, it is the body that has to resist first. But what shocked me about that period in the 60s or 70s is, is the idea of nudity and how this was not there. It is a body that exists, is a fragmented body. It's parts and bits of the body. A lot of things based on the face, on the mouth, a lot of idea of the censorship, the mouth, I can't speak, uh, you know, also related, of course, to the dictatorship, right? I can't see the vision occluded also. So there was a lot of face uh, or, or, or parts of the body, but never this idea of the liberation of the women body, like you have someone like Carol Schneeman here, right? You have Bali Export. It didn't have that. It's so interesting because you would think about that in Brazil, right? Everybody's naked. I mean, right? That's what you think about. Uh, so, it, it, there was nothing, nothing that I could see. There was one artist who did uh, a performance where she was naked, but she did in Paris in 1979, it was not in Brazil. So uh, there is this kind of moral, right? The quorum that existed, but the body was used very much as this place of resistance. But in the images, it's really, the fragmented body, the disjuncted body, you know, is not a cohesive kind of body. And that's also talks a lot about what, what they were doing, right? Yes. They are what? All right, all right, so funny, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the 60s, everything was against, mm -hmm. against, everybody was against, against, right? It's like manifestos against, yeah, yeah. But you're right, I mean, you know, they were all dissident from mainstream culture. They, they they were not part of the mainstream. They were not part of the dictatorship. They were not part of the uh, law and order. They were all against. They were all um, subversive in a way, right? Uh, at least in interesting ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting, all, all of the countries are so different. Like Mexico had a very strong feminist front of visual artists, but I think it's an exception really. 
um, in Latin America. Very, very interesting. Uh, yeah. What's the name? Uh, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh -huh. But that kind of Im imagery you don't have in Brazil in the fifth in the fifties and sixties. At least from these artists that became well known, became famous, you don't have that the idea of giving birth, right? Or female figures. Uh, the naked body painted. Where is that? It's not there. It's so interesting, right? I noticed also there is maybe no on these artists in the 50s and 70s, but there is this idea that the personal is religious, which is like from the second wave feminist because this is very personal like the uh this uh family picture of the free woman and like they take their own lives and they like talk about what like yeah like their experiences and i think that's also very subversive in a way to talk about the the personal yeah the personal being political. Right, right. That's that's the the problem is that this was not accepted, um, was not well seen, was not well accepted. So it was a second subversive way to do this to to do that because this was not what people thought was good art to talk about. You were personal. To be a Frida Kahlo was not the model. Arcelo de Amaral, what you did? Yeah, but but the, the idea of Arcelo de Amaral is that she went to Paris, and when she w went to Paris in the twenties. You know, Bertrand Zamora was was very rich. She came from a very wealthy family of coffee plantations owners. She had her family had slaves. So when she goes to Paris, they ask her, "Are you Brazilian?" She's like, "Me? Oh yeah." So, uh, what it is to be Brazilian? And then she goes back to Brazil and she starts searching this idea of the roots. What are her roots? Uh, and then she paints the black woman. I wish I had a, a picture. And uh, and the black woman that, that's a very famous uh, painting of her is of uh, is from a portrait of a black woman from her father's uh, farm, and when it was shown here at MoMA a few years ago, it was extremely criticized exhibition at MoMA because it was out of context. It was like the black woman as one of the originary people in Brazil, like the, you know, like the, 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 the base, right? The black and the indigenous people there in Brazil. Uh, but MoMA didn't really uh, acknowledge that this was a slave from her family. She comes from the upper middle white class. Uh, all this issue of class and race in Brazil was obliterated. And you can't do that today. It's not that it maybe didn't make any sense by then. It probably did not make any sense by then. She was not a racist because she was doing a black woman. I mean, I don't think so. But today you have to acknowledge that she, her family was a slave owner. And, you know, this was someone who worked in her plantation. And the fact that, you know, the woman have big breasts. And there is a legend that that Tarsila said that a uh, black woman, like they were wet nannies, and they have such a big breast that they throw their breasts in the back for the babies to suck them up. And you know, everybody says she's inventing this. This never existed. So she's a liar, and she's using that the the black woman to advance her career. That's how it, this is read today. That she's using that 
to advance her, going back to the idea of collective and individual, to advance her own career. Uh, so today you have to read the works from there and from you have to explain how it was seen then and how it is being uh, read today. And the exhibition was extremely criticized exactly for that painting. And the one I show you here, the Baporu, is uh, it, it's uh, in Tupi, the, the language, indigenous language means uh, the man who eats, Abaporu, Aba, the man, Poru, who eats. Uh, and it's an indigenous person. And that also became the symbol of anthropophagia, which is, you know, the idea of cultural cannibalism, which is the most quoted ever notion uh, of decolonial studies. But she created the image of that. I mean, it's, it's you know, and her husband wrote the Manifesto Anthropophagico in 1928. Uh, so he wrote this manifesto that says, let's absorb, let's appropriate the European culture, digest it, and then kind of uh, vomit it in, in, the, uh, in the Brazilian way. This is super decolonial studies today. It's back to Tarsela. So she is racist, but she's also the colonial. She, you know, it's like all these things, as you said, you're so, I just wanted to show you the image. They're so complicated, right? They're so like, uh, everything you talk today is, is really you have to think how you talk. That's why this book is so, is so difficult to do this book because every, every sentence you have to think like, oh my gosh, what am I saying? You have to talk about the 70s and, see, and talk about how these works are seen today. So, 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 and this work is in, in, in Argentina. It is at the Malba Museum in Argentina. The Museum of Modern Art in Argentina was bought by Eduardo Costantini here in New York in an auction in New York. And the Brazilians are so, so, super upset because this is the national image of Brazil. This is the visual artist of modern art in Brazil. This is the signifier of anthropophagia, cultural cannibalism, and it is in Argentina. It's not even in Brazil. <laughs> it's fabulous, right? Oswald de Andrade, who was the author and the novelist that wrote that manifesto in uh, 19. 28, but based on this and a negra. So, you know, so kind of, um, I, I think it's great. I mean, it was so difficult to write this book because it's, it's really stepping on eggs, right? Stepping on eggs, like, you know, but today everybody's feminist, right? If you talk to an artist from the, oh, I was a feminist. So that's also another layer of difficulty of doing that because they, they also think today it's cool to be a feminist. So they are saying, oh, I was. No, you're not. Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, how do you write that? How do you talk about that? So um, complicated, right? But we like complicated things, right? Otherwise, why bother? Right? What do you mean? Uh, I mean, like, uh, art production uh, from a feminist movement, like, not by individual artists, but like. No. I mean, I know about Mexico. I know about the production that was being done in American in Mexico that was very activist. There were, there were, again, in the social sphere, there were a lot, but that's nothing I'm really, it's not my field. I'm not, it, it's not a book, this book is not about feminism. This book is about how women reacted uh, to many different things. So it, it, feminism is just one part, it's one, one little thing, you know, it's about violence, it's about brutality, police brutality, it's about gangs, it's about um, criminality, it's about um, censorship. It's a, it's it's about so so many things that it, language. So each chapter is about something different. It's about trauma. So it's not it's not a feminist book. And I wanted to make very clear that that's not my goal to write about the history of feminism because it's something that 
I'm not even interested in, in doing that as well, so. Any other comments? No? I think we can end, right? Book. Thank yeah. you so, so much for coming and staying with us. Thank you.